So now we're going to move on to looking at ways to just describe movement. So we kind of talked about the things, you know, as far as le levers and things of that nature, kind of, kind of addressing that aspect of movement. Now we're going to look at ways to just kind of describe movement. The most basic way of doing that is kind of looking at the anatomical planes of the body. So we're going to look at the anatomical planes and we're also going to look at the, the axes, okay? And they correspond with one another. So this is how we're going to describe our movement. One thing I will tell you is um, as you're looking at this, um, you know, if you're not looking at it now in your textbook, pages 26 and 27, they kind of break down some of these movements. So again, if even some of the movement terms you're unfamiliar with, that could certainly help you with that as I'm going through that, because I don't have those illustrations in this in this presentation. So when we're kind of just looking at this in general, if you kind of look at the individual in this picture, this individual is in an anatomical position. So in the anatomical position, you're standing, your arms are down at your sides and your palms are facing forward. We then have the reference points for the anatomical planes. So we have here, we have the sagittal plane, which cuts the body into right and left halves. You have the frontal plane, which cuts the body into front and back. And you have the transverse plane, which cuts the body into upper and lower sections. Okay, now the key with this when we describe movements is that you always describe a movement as occurring through a plane and rotating around an axis. So first all we're gonna do is look at the planes. So when we look at the planes, movement goes through a plane. So let's look at what movements are gonna occur through the sagittal plane. So for instance, if you're in the anatomical position and you flex your elbows, so you bend your elbows, that's movement through the sagittal plane, okay? Elbow flexion, shoulder flexion, Okay, bringing your arms straight up overhead. Um, hip flexion, knee flexion, hip extension, knee extension. Those are all movements that occur through the sagittal plane. If we look at the frontal plane, frontal plane cuts the body into front and back. The movement of shoulder abduction, moving your arm out to the side, away from your midline and going up over your head. Um, shoulder adduction, bringing your arm back in that straight line to your body hip abduction, hip adduction, okay? Those are movements that occur through the frontal plane. Okay, those are some examples. As, as I'm going through this and when I'm done, go back and think of others, okay? The transverse plane is primarily a lot of your rotational movements, okay? So shoulder rotation, internal and external rotation. Uh, trunk rotation is transverse plane. You rotate your trunk hip internal and external rotation. Those are movements that go through the plane, through the transverse plane, okay? So that's the starting point to this description. Why it's important that you at least know this is that next we're gonna talk about a corresponding axis. The easiest part about this is when you have the planes and the axes, each plane has a corresponding axis. So once you know the plane, you know the axis and vice versa. Okay, they both correspond with one another. So here's your axes. Again, movement occurs through a plane and around an axis. So you have your, your frontal plane or your medial lateral, your sagittal plane or the anterior posterior, and your longitudinal, your vertical. So and I want you to know both names. Your, your book only uses the terms in regards to the axes as frontal, sagittal, and longitudinal. I'm having you learn both. And the reason why is that, you know, in other classes, it'll make it a lot easier because you're, you're probably going to run into this again. You may end up for the, for the axes, you may end up learning the different terminology. So I want to make you familiar with each one of them. If you look at this picture, you could kind of see, you can tell. So here you have your planes. So your planes are kind of represented by the, the square rectangular shapes, again, kind of cutting the body as we described. The axes are represented by the dotted line, okay? And again, the axes run perpendicular to the planes, okay? So in other words, if you move through the sagittal plane, so think of a movement, so right now, I'll give you a little bit of time, think of a movement that runs through the sagittal plane. 
Okay, so if you said shoulder flexion, if you said hip flexion, if you said knee flexion, if you said elbow extension, hip extension, knee extension, they all occur through the sagittal plane. They occur through the sagittal plane. They rotate around the frontal or medial lateral axis. So movement that occurs in the sagittal plane rotates around the frontal or the medial lateral axis. So it's also called the medial lateral axis because that's how it runs, okay? If we go through a movement in the frontal plane, so shoulder abduction, hip abduction, both forms of adduction, okay? Um, wrist ulnar and radial deviation, Okay, they all occur in the frontal plane. They occur in a frontal plane and rotate around the sagittal axis. So if you notice, the sagittal axis runs perpendicular to the frontal plane. So you wrote, so again, if this person were to abduct their shoulder, bring their arms straight up like this and around overhead, they would be moving through the frontal plane and their shoulder would be rotating around the sagittal or the anterior posterior axis. Your rotational movements we said occur through the transverse plane and they rotate around the longitudinal axis. So if this person were to rotate their trunk, okay, take their trunk and rotate it, they would be moving through the transverse plane, they'd be rotating around the vertical axis, okay? So if you know the plane, you know the axis and vice versa. Okay, they correspond with one another. Okay, it gets a little, it gets a little difficult if you don't understand it and try to memorize it because you'll say, well, if it moves through the frontal plane, it moves around the frontal axis. That's not how it works. Remember, the axis runs perpendicular to the plane. Okay, so if you move in the frontal plane, you're moving around the sagittal or the anterior posterior axis. If you're moving through the sagittal plane, you're moving around the frontal or the medial lateral axis. And if you're, rotate, if you're moving through the transverse plane, you're rotating through the longitudinal vertical axis. So again, go back to those pages that I discussed earlier and make sure you have a good understanding. Look at those motions. And again, this will be something that we, we certainly bring up. And if people have questions about, we can bring it up when we uh, address it during our session. So we're gonna look at some kind of definitions regarding human strength and power, because it's important to be able to sort of look at, you know, what some of these things mean. Like just for instance, there's, there's a difference between strength and power. Like we tend to talk about them as if they are the same thing. Now, again, they're related, as are a lot of these things we're gonna talk about. We're gonna see that as we discuss these definitions, there's things where they're all in, involved with each other. So, but we have to be able to know the difference between all of them. So, for instance, the term strength is just the ability to exert force. So, strength is literally just apply your, your ability to apply force. So, it's basically going to be the, you know, when you go and, you know, for instance, when you're lifting weight, your ability to demonstrate your strength is going to be based upon how, you know, how much force you're able to produce. Now, there's different types of strength. You know, for instance, we, we commonly think when, when just looking and just to relate this to the actual strength training, we, we always think of strength being developed through lifting weights, but there's also work that gets done in lowering weight through what's called eccentric contraction. So that's when your work gets performed on a muscle rather than by the muscle. And we'll talk about the difference between those two contractions later on. But strength is strictly just the ability to apply force. It doesn't involves speed or time or anything like that. It's just your force application. Acceleration is a change in velocity per unit time. Okay, it's a change in velocity per unit time. So, you know, for instance, when you look at track and field, the start of the race involves acceleration until that, that runner gets to their, hits their max velocity up until that point, there, there's change in velocity. And a lot of times, the faster they accelerate and the longer they accelerate for many times, that kind of dictates their, their success. And, you know, and you have acceleration of implements and things like that with, with sports that involve, you know, for instance, like, you know, baseball bats and tennis rackets, we could kind of measure that. It's also associated with 
uh, Newton's second law, so force equals mass times acceleration. So here again, we already start to see that one's, you know, force also looks at the ability to, you know, be able to accelerate, you know, through either muscular work or through, uh, through an object. Work is force, is a product of force and displacement. So we look at basically whenever you're going to calculate work, okay, you look at how much force you're having to apply and how much whatever that, however far that distance is traveled with the amount of force being applied to whatever it is. So take, for instance, again, we'll use a simple example of, uh, you know, a barbell squat exercise. If you, you know, if you squat 400 pounds, okay, so let's just say you're looking at 400 pounds of force. However far the barbell travels, that's your displacement. So if we were to calculate work being done, you would take the 400 pounds and multiply it by how, you know, the distance that the barbell actually travels. Okay, so that's mechanical work. Power is work divided by time. So now we're starting to get into a time element. Um, another way power gets expressed is force times velocity. Okay, so force time. So if you ever see this, because um, this is something that it, it, it's come up in the past with students, um, you know, they, they hear that power is work divided by time, which is very true, but it's also force times velocity. Both of those equations work the same. So it's the rate of doing work. Okay, um, sometimes people dis discuss this as explosive strength. Okay, that's kind of another way that that this sometimes gets, you know, gets looked at. But, you know, for the most part, you're looking at both, you're, you're looking at both how fast something is moving, which how much force is being produced behind it. Negative work, again, goes back to that eccentric contraction I was talking about. Okay, so negative work is when work is being done to the muscle. So the lowering of the weight or decelerating a, move, a movement, okay? There's work involved there, but it's negative work because now you don't have direct work being performed by the muscle. The muscle's trying to either control something or absorb something, okay? That's negative work. And then you have angular work and power. So all this is is rotational work. So when you talk about angular work and power, okay? We're just looking at now this being rotational work. So instead of you know something working in a in a linear fashion, we're now creating rotation. So this is torque times angular displacement. Torque is essentially again force being produced rotationally. Okay. So you have angular movement, which is going to be rotational movement. You have linear movement, and this is referring to that that rotational movement. And again, here, this is just kind of what I said. So although the, the word strength is associated with slow speeds and the word power with high velocities of movement, both variables reflect the ability to exert force at a given velocity. So again, this is where I was saying, you know, these things, when we, when we start to look at this as far as the application of, you know, you know, bringing these qualities back during rehabilitation or enhancing them during performance training, you have to be able to look at the variables that which you're applying these concepts to help improve whatever qualities in the person you're trying to, okay? And again, I would say this exists outside of athletics, okay? So, you know, for, you know, someone who works in, let's say, a, you know, a manufacturing plant or something like that, you know, they may have some, or, or, or someone who does a lot of really heavy labor, a certain degree of power, being able to produce power is beneficial to them, okay? So, you know, maybe their goal isn't to, to break any world records in lifting or an athletic event, but they still need to be able to do that. So it's important to kind of understand these variables when you start to assign, um, when you start to assign, for instance, like percentages and, and what people are going to be doing as far as their exercise is concerned. So in looking at biomechanical factors in human strength, another thing you have to look at the nervous system. The nervous system is very important. There's adaptations that take place in the nervous system when you're looking to develop strength. So recruitment affects maximal force. 
Okay, and yeah, again, we have to look at which and how many motor units are involved in a muscle contraction. So the way in which our muscle contractions are graded, if you go back to the discussion on structure and function, we talked about how a motor unit operates on that all or none principle. Okay, when a motor unit's activated, motor unit has to be activated, all the fibers contract maximally or don't contract at all. Your ability to kind of grade your strength or how much force a muscle puts involves how many motor units are going to be involved. Rate coding also affects that by determining the rate at which they're fired. So that looks at, at how fast those individual motor units are getting recruited. Okay, so that's when you look at power. Again, power has a time component. So there's a cert, we look at the amount of speed of contraction and how fast those different motor units are going to be getting recruited. So really you look at three factors in muscle force, okay? So you look at the amount of motor units that are involved. So we want more, more motor units involved. We looked at the motor units being larger in size because the larger the, the size of the motor units, the greater the force you're gonna be able to do. And the rate of firing is fast. So those are three factors that are gonna create larger amounts of muscle force. And we also have to consider the muscle cross-sectional area. So the larger the cross-section of the muscle, that is also gonna impact how much strength that the, the muscle is able to um, be able to produce. Okay, some other biomechanical uh, factors are the arrangement of muscle fibers. Okay, so we, we're gonna look at the, the arrangement of muscle fibers. So a pennate muscle is when the muscle fibers align obliquely with the tendon and they create a feather-like arrangement. Okay, so that's what we would call a pennate muscle. And the angle of pennation is the angle between the muscle fibers and the line between the muscle's origin and insertion. Okay, zero degrees corresponds to no pennation. So when we look at this, different muscles are gonna have a different arrangement of their muscle fibers. And I'm gonna show a picture of this that's also in your textbook that's gonna kind of show you when you have muscles that are arranged in a pennate fashion, those muscles have a greater propensity for force development. Now, any muscle could develop a certain degree of force, but certain muscles in our body, based upon what their responsibilities are, are going to be aligned in this fashion to be more, uh, more advantageous for force production, whereas other muscles will kind of take on other, um, another type of, of formation as far as the fiber orientation based upon what they do. So an example of the, the muscle fibers. So if you look here, so you can see in this, in this picture, you have different muscle fiber orientations, okay? So, and they kind of match them up with, with the letters. So here, so that for instance, the biceps brachii is a fusiform muscle. So notice the fusiform muscles now you have the, the muscle fibers being in line with the tendinous insertion. So this isn't what we were talking about on the, the previous slide. The previous slide, we were talking about the pennate muscles. So notice the difference between the biceps brachii and the fusiform formation of that and the bipennate formation of the rectus femoris. So the rectus femoris, which is one of your quadriceps muscles, notice how the muscle fibers go at an angle. So they don't go right in line with the tendon. So initially you could look at this and look at this. If you look at it quick, you'd say, well, they're both the same type of muscle fiber structure, but notice here how the fibers kind of come out from the center and they call that a bipennate because there's two, two pennates, okay? Comes out in two different directions. You have a unipennate muscle, which you have with the tibialis posterior, which is a muscle in the lower leg. And then you have a multipennate muscle, which is the deltoid muscle in your shoulder, where you have multiple, um, where you have basically have more than you know more than two pennates coming out as far as the uh, the, the fiber structure is concerned. So the difference when you're looking at this is pennate muscles don't have as fast a contract of a contraction velocity. So in other words, they don't tend to contract as fast, but they tend to contract with more strength and power. Whereas a muscle like the a fusiform muscle, okay, or a longitudinal muscle, or even a, a, 
irradiate muscle, they tend to have a faster shortening velocity. Okay, so you, you look at the trade-off between force production and shortening velocity. Okay, so lesser when you when you when you have that penation, it basically allows you to produce more force behind with uh, with the muscle. Okay, another factor related to, to strength and power, I'm just gonna pull all this up because with the, with the picture, it'll make more sense, is when we look at the length of the muscle, we did, we did kind of talk about this briefly in the last section, we're gonna bring this up again. So hopefully some of this looks familiar as it relates to going back and, and looking at things like the sliding filament theory, okay? So when a muscle is at its resting length, the actin and myosin filaments are next to each other, so there's a maximal number of potential cross bridges available, okay? So it's at that, the muscle can, it can generate its greatest force when you're starting at resting length, okay? So at resting length, which is what we're looking at here, okay, resting length, you have that, that the most potential, greatest potential for the cross bridges you're going to be able to have. So right here, is where you're gonna be able to generate your optimal amount of force from, okay? When a smaller portion of the actin and filaments lie next to each other, there's fewer potential cross bridge sites available, okay? So when we look at, say, when the muscle is lengthened and stretched, there's fewer, poten there's, there's fewer potential. You don't have those cross bridges close enough to each other to the point where you can generate a great deal of force, okay? Now you also have the situation where you're starting a muscle from a shortened position. When a muscle's already shortened, you same thing, you can't generate as much force. Now for a different reason than when it's lengthened, but when it's contracted, okay, you've kind of already taken up, you've essentially taken up all of those, um, all, of that, all of that slack within the muscle. You already have the overlap Therefore, you don't have that ability to generate force. So the optimal length for generating force is from resting length, okay? Because you have the cross bridges available. You basically have the room for the actin and myosin filaments to slide over one another. Therefore, you can generate the, the greatest amount of force once you can do that, okay? Again, if they already overlap, okay, your number of cross bridge sites are gonna be reduced again, and therefore you, you are gonna have reduced force capability. If you're lengthened, okay, you don't have the actin and myosin filaments close enough to each other, it's gonna require more effort to then generate that same amount of force. So still looking at human strength and power. Okay, the joint angle, okay? So the amount of torque that a joint can produce depends on the force versus the muscle length, the leverage, type of exercise, body joint in question, the muscles used at the joint and the speed of contraction. So essentially what you're, what you're looking at, so those are all factors related to that as far as how force gets produced with the joints. So when you look at joint angle, okay, the amount of torque that can be exerted by a body joint varies based throughout the range of motion, okay? So if you look, when we talked about earlier, when we were looking a lot at the elbow joint in the, the, previous, um, the, the previous, uh, this previous parts of the discussion. So if you go back and kind of look at some of the illustrations regarding the elbow joint, so as you're going through that range of motion, another thing that's gonna dictate where the greatest torque is produced is the joint angle, okay? So the, the joint angle, for instance, that the elbow, just looking at the elbow as an example, the, the joint angle that produces the greatest amount of torque is right at that 90 degrees, which for various reasons in the joint structure, we need that to happen. So joint angle is gonna impact the amount of, um, the amount of torque or the amount of force that a joint could produce, okay? So again, when, when we're looking at joint angle, you know, it, it's a non-linear, when we're looking at the way joints work, it's non-linear motion, but 
if you're looking to produce linear motion through force or something like that, we need the joints to be able to work. So that's going to vary and kind of change based upon the type of contraction and, and what it is you're trying to do um, functionally with your movement. Another thing that impacts strength is how fast the muscles contraction, contracting, okay? So the amount of force a muscle can produce is going to decrease as the velocity of the contraction increases. So essentially what that's saying is the faster you're trying to produce a contraction, the less force you can produce behind it, okay? So here's a really good example of how that works. Okay, if you were to go outside, okay, and take a wiffle ball versus a baseball and try to throw it as far as you can, which one are you going to throw further? Okay, in all likelihood, you're going to throw the baseball further. Okay, the reason why is, is that you, you basically, when you go to throw the wiffle ball, it's so light the speed of your contraction is so fast you can't put as much force behind the wiffle ball. If you were strictly just looking at the weight of the object, you would say to yourself, well, the wiffle ball is much lighter. You should be able to throw it further. The problem is, is that it's so light. When you go to throw it, you basically produce, you basically produce the muscle contraction so fast you can't produce as much force behind it. Okay. Um, there's other examples of this I can show you, but essentially, if you if you contract your muscles too fast, they don't have enough time to produce force. Okay. Now there's optimal again. There's optimal weights and percentages and stuff like that that again to work on strength we'll use, and that's something that'll come down the road. Just know for now that when muscles contract at a really fast rate, they don't have the ability to produce as much force. Same thing with joint angular velocity. So again, this is just looking at the nonlinear fashion that our joints work through. It's essentially the, 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 same, the same type of concept. Again, the, the faster you try to move, the less force you're going to be able to apply. Okay. So when we're looking at, at these three concepts here, essentially joint angle, so joint angle could dictate how much strength, certain joints in the body, certain positions you're going to be able, you will produce more force versus other parts. Okay, again, going back to the elbow, you're going to be able to produce the most force. This is just one example. You'll be able to produce the most force at 90 degrees. And again, there's various reasons for that, but that's what you're, you're looking at with that. So joint angle dictates that. The contraction velocity, the faster you contract, the less the, the less the less force you can produce okay and joint angular velocity is the same concept you're just looking at rotational movement okay as that we're again producing at our joints so this takes us to muscle actions and i, I kind of started to talk about this already now th there are actual other muscle actions that uh, get talked about you know we're, we're only going to focus on three of them right now so we're going to look at the concentric action. So this is the action when a muscle shortens. Okay. So concentric action is when the muscle shortens because the contractile force is greater than the resistive force. Okay. So real simple idea. You grab a dumbbell. Okay. Say it's a 20 pound dumbbell. And let's say you could overcome that force of the dumbbell by doing a, a, an elbow flexion or a curl exercise. You will create a sh muscle shortening action of the bicep okay so now if you couldn't overcome the resistive force or you couldn't produce force greater than the resistive force you wouldn't be able to shorten the muscle you would you know be basically tightening up the muscle trying to get it to work but you wouldn't be able to shorten so this is the shortening action of the muscle the eccentric is the muscle action when it lengthens because the contractile force is less than the resistive force okay or it's just the deceleration force when you're either lowering a weight or trying to slow down from running. It's basically muscle lengthening. So let's go back to that previous discussion. Now, it's not the case where, the, where you're, you're, you're unable to lift it. Let's go back to that bicep curl example. Okay. So you shorten it, you curl, you flex your elbow. When you're bringing the weight back down, you're then lengthening the bicep. 
okay? It's lengthening of the bicep that does that. That's the muscle lengthening aspect. You can also overload the muscle. So for instance, eccentric contractions are actually stronger than concentric. You can lower a weight with a much greater amount than you could lift or work through concentric shortening. So for instance, say you can, you know, you can bench press 300 pounds. You could actually put on, uh, on a barbell, you could put on 330 pounds and you could lower it through eccentric contraction under control. Now you won't be able to lift it off your chest, but you can, you can do that. So eccentric contractions are actually stronger and you could do more with it, okay? Um, but that's the lengthening contraction. Isometric is when the muscle doesn't change length at all. So when a muscle contracts, but the length doesn't change, that's your isometric action. And what that means is the contractile force is equal to the resistive force, okay? So if you were to look at, if you were to look at a, you know, any movement where you're, you're unable to lengthen or shorten the muscle, or you just don't produce movement, that's what you have with an isometric contraction. Okay, so say you were just to go over to a wall and push into it, okay, chances are you're, you're not going to be able to, you know, push or move a wall, but you're going to be able to produce enough contractile force equal to the resistive force, and you're not going to get a change in muscle length. So concentric, muscle shortening, eccentric, muscle lengthening, isometric, no change in muscle action. Now, this is an important thing to look at, again, for, you know, the, the purposes of developing different physical qualities. So, and again, I always, I always pref, I, you know, I, I'll preface everything, regardless whether I use examples from athletics or not. These are important concepts for, for kind of everybody when you're, when you're looking at this, okay? So force velocity, again, the, these things interact with each other. So if you notice looking at this, now just to orientate yourself, again, always orientate yourself to graphs and everything before you just start looking at it because it can be really confusing. So here we're looking at joint angular velocity, okay? So we're looking at an increase in velocity here. So this is zero, okay? This is working in positive, this is working in negative, okay? Isometric, there's no change in, in length, okay? So you have, con it's showing you what happens with a concentric contraction. It's showing you what happens with an eccentric contraction. So you notice this going back to what I talked about. Remember muscle velocity can dictate how much force you produce, okay? So notice with the concentric contraction, the shortening contraction, what is happening to the amount of torque or the amount of rotational force as the speed of contraction is going up? What do you notice what's happening, okay? As the speed goes up, the amount of torque produces decreases, okay? That's what we said earlier. So the faster the shortening contraction, the less force you're gonna produce behind it. And again, the reason for that is because you don't have time to generate it, okay? Now notice what happens when you look at, at eccentric contractions with eccentric contractions, it does actually, speed actually increases force up to a point. Now it does start to trail off, but the speed of the eccentric contraction actually will increase the force, okay? It does start to level off and start to dip, but initially you get an increase in force. So this is part of the reason why, again, working different types of contractions for, for different physical qualities is important. Um, and you see that that speed, the amount of force with eccentric contractions becoming very important, obviously from the standpoint of being able to, you know, decelerate the body, um, you know, the interaction with plyometrics and jumping, that's where all of this becomes, becomes very important to, to understand the concepts. So coming back to that concept of human strength and power, we're actually gonna cut back into some biomechanical factors Another thing to consider is the strength to mass ratio, okay? So looking at the, someone's size and the relative strength that they have. So, you know, for instance, in sprinting and jumping, the ratio reflects an athlete's ability to accelerate his or her body. 
And in sports involving weight classification, the ratio helps determine when strength is highest relative to that of other athletes in weight classes. So body size, what this means is body size impacts that strength to mass ratio. As body size increases, the mass increases more rapidly than does muscle strength. Okay, so in other words, given constant body proportions, smaller athletes tend to have a higher strength to mass ratio than a larger athlete. This is why it's, it's very common, again, all things being equal, okay? All things being equal, a smaller athlete, for instance, will be able to do more body weight exercises, okay? So the contractile force is proportionate to the cross-sectional area in their body dimensions. So that's why, again, you know, you take two athletes, a bigger one, a smaller one, even though the bigger one might be able to lift more weights, okay? They might be able to bench press and squat more. Relative to body size, the smaller athlete could actually have a higher what's called relative strength. That means their, their body mass corresponds with their strength abilities. That's why, I, that's why a lot of times smaller individuals can do like more body weight exercises. They can do more pull-ups and push-ups and things like that, okay? So that's where body size also comes in. So again, just as I said, given constant body pr proportions, smaller athletes tend to have a higher strength to mass ratio than larger athletes. Okay, because larger athletes then also have much higher body weight to deal with. Now, if we're just looking at absolute strength, okay, so relative strength looks at strength to mass ratio. Absolute strength just means whatever, how much force you can you could produce. Bigger athletes are many times going to have greater absolute strength, okay, which is part of the reason why we have, for instance, like in, in you know, if you look at like wrestling and combat sports you have weight classes because you're not going to put a super heavyweight against a lightweight chances are the super heavyweight's going to already have a built-in advantage just because they're so much bigger okay again it's not always there's always exceptions to the rule but for the most part that's what you're going to be looking at and dealing with so body size becomes an important thing with that so we're going to look at sources of resistance to muscle contraction, and we're going to look at the idea of gravity, okay? So first of all, you have to d distinguish between the concepts of weight and mass. Again, we use weight and mass kind of interchangeably, but they're not the same thing, okay? The downward force of an object from the pool of gravity is the object's weight, okay? That's actually equal to the object's mass times the local acceleration due to gravity. So when you, when you hear the term weight, that's actually referring to the object's mass and its interaction with gravity. Mass is actually basically how much of a substance you have, okay? So weight and mass technically aren't the same thing. So gravity, when we look at the applications to resistance training, now again, we refer to everything as how much something weighs or its weight, and we refer to that as pounds. So pounds is actually a unit of force, okay? It's actually not a product of, it's actually not mass, okay? Um, so in other words, the mass of the barbell, so when we're looking at this, this individual performing a deadlift here, the mass of the barbell stays the same, okay? But the, the actual weight is gonna vary according to the local acceleration due to gravity, okay? So technically, when we're, when we're using those terms, again, it's important to, again, understand the terminology, okay? So for instance, your book gives the example, um, if, you were, you know, if you were to take a barbell to the moon, okay? It's a little bit of a silly example, but it, it, it kind of allows us to make sense. If you took an 85 kilogram barbell, so kilograms is looking at the mass, okay? It would actually feel as if it were lighter. Now, the, the, the barbell didn't change. What changed was you don't have gravity impacting it the way you do on Earth, okay? So the amount of mass that an individual can actually lift 
can be would be affected by by terrestrial location because of variations in acceleration of gravity okay so that's an important distinction another thing we look at here another important thing to look at is the the resistive torque on the joints okay so because gravity is acting gravity is essentially pulling the the weight the barbell down in a straight line okay when you look at this individual performing the lift okay the amount of torque that the joints have to produce the horizontal distance from the joint it actually is exerting more resistive torque so if we look at these pictures okay look at the the distance from the hip joint so let's say her hip joint you know her hip joints right about there so look at the horizontal distance here at the starting position versus here versus here so where is the torque going to be the greatest on the joint where is the resistive torque going to be the greatest well it's going to be at the start because the horizontal distance is the greatest so she is the most torque getting produced on the joint right here versus here and versus here at this point for the most part there's not as there's not as much resistive torque so the amount of force being applied is going to change throughout the lift okay so body position and gravity and the relationship there is going to change how much the, the stress on the muscle groups and what muscle groups have to become involved more or less to kind of um, function when you're looking at resistive exercise. Okay, gravity is also important. So we, we use weight stack machines a lot. So again, gravity is the source of resistance, but machines actually provide control over the direction and patterns of resistance. So unlike barbell exercises, okay, again, which, you know, gravity is going to impact and gravity will still impact with weight stack machines, okay, with weight stack machines, particularly those that are what are called cam based. So, you know, a cam is a part of a weight machine that actually kind of adjusts the resistance based upon the position of the of the joint so what they try to do is match the resistance to the to the positioning of the joint because as we said joint position is going to impact how much torque and everything needs to be produced in order to lift the weights so in in cam based weight stack machines the moment arm of the weight stack okay so the moment arm of the weight stack which is the horizontal distance from the chain or the cable to the cam pivot will vary during the exercise motion, okay? So if you look at the picture, when the cam is rotated in the direction shown from position one to position two, so if you look at position one and position two, and you look at it relative to the, the cam and the, the chain, or you know, typically they use cables in, in weight machines, the moment arm of the weights and the resistive torque will actually increase, okay? So we actually, what the machines actually look to do is increase the torque going from here to here. Why is that? Because the machine ideally wants to match the strength curve. So here, as we said, if we're just strictly looking at the elbow joint, this is the angle at which the elbow could produce most of its torque. So what the machine looks to do is match that. The machine wants to produce most of its torque here to match where your body has it. So what that does is it allows the weight machines to overload the movement based upon the angle of contraction. Okay, so ideally with weight stack machines, what they try to do in the case of the cam, what they call cam based weight stack machines they look to actually vary the resistance. So even though you're saying the weight stack remains the same. So, you know, let's say the weight stack, you know, at this point, let's say it's whatever, 60 pounds. Okay. So if, if you kept it just, at, if you were just talking about lifting 60 pounds, okay, it's actually going to get easier once you get to this point. It's going to be hard to start it, but it's going to be easier once it's here. What the cam based weight stack machine looks to do is increase the difficulty at position two, where it would be the easiest and thus actually kind of match the fact so you could produce the most torque there, 
the weight machine wants to actually create a different, a, a change in the resistance when you're actually loaded at that point. Okay, some other sources of resistance to muscle contraction. So these are just some other concepts related to physics that we're gonna look at and how, how it kind of impacts muscle contraction. So the concept of inertia looks at the resistance of an object to change its state and motion. Okay, so you know all objects have a, a certain amount of inertia. So inertia is its resistance to either, so it's the concept of an object at rest remains at rest, an object in motion stays at motion unless acted on by an outside source. So that's its, that's its resistance to that. So when we look at a, an object and the forces that are acting on it, so we know gravity only acts downward. Inertia could act in any direction, okay? So, however, when you're looking to do upward or lateral acceleration, it requires additional force. So when we're looking at just say again, lifting weights, because that's the simplest way to look at this, okay? You have to accelerate to initiate the lift, you have to decelerate at the end. So the resistance is actually, it's greatest at the beginning, but it's actually decreased at the end, okay? So when you, the, the hardest part of a lift is initiating it because of the inertia, because you have to produce enough force to overcome the inertia of the resistance. So a, a barbell on the ground, if you're going to deadlift a barbell, okay, so why the deadlift is actually the hardest of the lifts, because you don't initiate it, we don't have an eccentric contraction to initiate the, the stretch reflex and make it easier. If you look at a deadlift, <clears throat> A, that barbell on the ground has a certain amount of inertia. It's its resistance to its change in motion. In order for you to start the lift, you have to apply more force. Towards the end though, you don't need as much force because you already have the barbell moving, okay? So the resistance tends to be greatest at the beginning, decreases at the end. That's the concept when we relate to inertia. Friction is the resistive force encounters when one object attempts to, to move on an object while they're pressed together, okay? Now, friction can be beneficial in some ways. You know, for instance, that's one of the reasons why, you know, a, a lifter will use like, you know, chalk on their hands to actually create friction. But in some cases, it could increase resistive force. So if we look at weight sleds, um, you have, you know, but depending upon the surface you're pushing the sled on will dictate how hard it is. So in other words, if I, if I take a weighted sled and put 70 pounds on it, that 70 pounds will feel very different on say turf versus blacktop. Okay. Because there'll be less friction on the turf that 70 pounds won't feel the same way as you, as it does when it's being pushed or pulled on blacktop. So friction is something that will will in, will will increase could possibly increase resistance as well. Fluid resistance is the resistive force encountered by an object moving through a fluid. Okay. Now air is also technique, and this is where sometimes science terms can be confusing. Air is actually a fluid. Okay. So if I said fluid resistance right away, everyone's going to think of you know liquid water resistance, which is true. But air is technically a fluid too. So fluids are going to impact the resistance too. So obviously we think right away with this, we think of the resistance coming from water when you're referring to sports, but obviously air could, could provide resistance as well. And the last one is elasticity. The more an elastic component is stretched, the greater the resistance. Okay, so if you're using bands for resistance training, the more the band gets stretched, the more resistance there is. So bands are kind of nice because they work with the strength curve as well. So when you're doing a band exercise, okay, you know, typically again, exercises get easy, technically get easier towards the end. Well, if you're using band resistance, it actually gets harder. That's because of the elastic properties of the resistance band. So elasticity, if you have an elastic resistance, that's also going to change the, the dynamics as far as muscle contraction is concerned as well. So now some concerns in resistance training. So kind of a little preview or a little discussion in as far as injuries concerned with resistance training. 
So back injuries are probably one of the more common things. The lower back in particular is vulnerable, particularly at the L4, L5, and L5-S1 region. Um, you know, that tends to be where a lot of injuries at the low back take place for, for various reasons. Um, if we look at the deadlift, again, we want to try to keep the low back as neutral, you know, for instance, we want to keep the low back in as neutral a position as possible. Now, yes, when you look at powerlifting competitions and things like that, you, you tend to see a lot of lifters go into a little bit of a rounded back. Again, that's kind of a risk benefit thing you kind of look to weigh when individuals are in a sport such as that. Um, but generally with resistance training, they should generally be performed with the low back in a moderately arched or neutral position. So, you know, if you are going to round the back, there are kind of some, you know, qualifiers that need to take place there. So you don't have to be per se scared to move the back or to stress the back, but you do have to be concerned particularly when you have a lot of directed force, particularly on those levels, um, you know, that tends to be where injury tends to occur. So when the back, when you kind of get focal forces being placed at one joint level in the low back, that's usually where your injuries are going to take place. So just a key point. So, you know, people talk about resistance training being dangerous. Actually, resistance training when you look at the risk of injury from resistance training, it's actually quite low compared to other sporting activities. So as I'm discussing a lot of this, you know, we always talk about, you know, you hear many people talk about, you know, heavy strength training and how dangerous it is. Yeah, there's risk of, there certainly is a risk of injury, particularly when you're talking strength sports and trying to really push the limits. But for the most part, a very safe, and I'm not saying that it's lightweights either, a safe resistance training program, good technique, even with you know relatively heavy weights relative to what the person is doing, the risk of injury is low compared to many other sports. Okay, if if you look at the amount of chronic injuries that occur because of like say distance running. Okay, so you know I've had it told to me many you know distance runners will will know what I do lifting you know for me personally and they'll say well that's dangerous that's dangerous yet they have all these overuse injuries that I don't have. Um, so it's important to kind of consider that. Um, and, and certainly there's a lot of studies, and this will be something we talk about down the road. There's plenty of studies that show that, that strength training, you know, benefits, you know, you know their, their life expectancy and everything else. There, there's a lot of benefits to it. So it, it's just a kind of an important point to highlight, even though as we talk about some of these injury things that can occur. So again, focusing on the back, um, one of the things you want to be able to do is create, particularly when you're lifting with heavy weights, is creating that fluid ball of intra-abdominal pressure. So what that's going to do is basically what you do is you breathe in and take a heavy bracing maneuver where you contract the abdominals and the diaphragm together and, you know, kind of hold your air. So you close up your glottis to keep air from, from escaping the 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 lungs what that does is creates a very rigid torso if you look at this picture by doing that you create a rigid torso the other thing that does is allows you to utilize a lot of times in talking about weightlifting belts um, weightlifting belts can help with a lift but you have to know how to use them right so the idea behind a weight belt is you brace against it so your your abdomen still has to work but it acts as a support and almost a cueing mechanism to get your abdominals to contract harder while you're doing the lift, okay? And the idea here is to get the deep abdominal muscles to contract, the diaphragm to contract. You do what's called the Valsalva maneuver. That's that kind of bearing down that you do, um, again, underneath a deep breath. Now, if you're going to use a Valsalva maneuver, it's important that you only Valsalva for a short period of time. This isn't something you're going to do for a long period of time. You know, there's, there's blood pressure things and, and things like that that become uh, a precaution. And, you know, you could obviously, if you'd Valsalva for too long under force, you can, you know, make yourself pass out or, or you know, some other type of injury could happen as well. Um, now, weightlifting belts... I think weightlifting belts are good. Most people support the use of weightlifting belts, particularly with heavier exercises. 
With lighter weights, you don't need a belt, okay? So you should try to train yourself to be able to brace without a belt so that when you go to use a belt, you, you use it correctly and you actually still produce that bracing maneuver. So, you know, you'll hear people say, well, it's, it's a crutch and everything else. Well, it, it's actually not. It is actually just a tool that you'll use to enhance your strength training. It just needs to be used properly. Okay, so your book discusses the other body areas. What I want you to do, okay, so th this is kind of a homework assignment for yourself, is look at these other areas of the body, the shoulders, knees, elbows, and wrists. So when we look at these three areas and, and kind of the concerns in resistance training, the risk of injury, look at each one of these areas, okay? Make an outline to yourself as to why these different, we, we know that obviously these are all areas of the body that, are, that, are, that can be prone to injury. What about the structure of these joints? Okay, the structure, the function, the range of motion, what particularly makes them vulnerable to injury? Okay, I want you to kind of look at that. So, you know, use your textbook as, as a guide for that and kind of make some notes to yourself. This will be something that, because we, we, we will use that uh, as a discussion assignment uh, down the road as we, as we kind of look at and review these concepts. Okay, and these are your, your learning outcomes. So these are kind of the things you should be able to, um, to kind of identify when you're, when you're looking at this. One, one kind of, um, I guess, edit I'll make to this. I am not gonna make you calculate linear and rotational work but, and power, but you should be able to define. So you could strike out calculate. I'm not gonna make you calculate it, but you should be able to define, differentiate, list, identify concepts related to these ideas. You will not have to calculate. So that's, I guess that's one edit I would put in here. You could kind of strike out calculate be able to identify the differences between linear rot and rotational work and power, be able to define them, but you won't have to calculate anything. And these are the rest of your learning outcomes. Again, the learning outcomes are here for you to be able to look at the things, be able to organize the things you understand, don't understand, and the things you need more, more work with.